All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Just to make sure you're in the right place, we're going to be talking about youth led research in this session. So, welcome. My name is Lane Robinson, and we will be, I'll be moderating. Um, on the, she said I should use tech, but on the tech side, we have Laura. So, <laughs> we need tech. It's a hybrid meeting, remember? And we have um, Tamara, who's just coming in, who's repertory for the session. And we have all of you here. I'm going to ask you to just say hello a little bit from where you're from, and then I'm going to present our first speakers, who two are in the room and one is online. So just to make sure we get a sense of those who are in the room. So from the front here, just say hello where you're from. Hi, Everton from Jamaica. Thanks. Hamza, where are you from? I am from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Next one. Robin from London. In London. UK. Vegeta from India. India. Okay, from Paisley in Scotland. Scotland. Julie from Scotland. Scotland. I'm deep here from Ghana. Ghana. I'm Connor from Belfast in Ireland. Ireland. Orlea from Ireland. Ireland. from Ireland. Ireland. From the and, <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm Adam, uh, based in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Uh, both from Malawi. Malawi. Or Kirsten from Cardiff from Wales. Wales. Deha, based in London. London. JV from London. London, UK. Johnny mm -hmm. from Grenada. Yes, and I'm, and we wonder if there are any online who could hear us, if they could just let us know um, if you're hearing us, so say where you're from, and we could recognize if you're able to, and we'll get that communicated. But right now, let me also welcome Dorothy and Matthew, who will be sharing first up. Um, I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the work you do in terms of beauty. So over to you, Dorothy and Matthew. All right, yeah, should we, should we begin? Are we doing the presentation? Or yes, the presentation? absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought Great. we could do, yeah. You can work me with it, so you introduce a little bit and then. So, yeah. hi, my name's Matthew. Um, I work for Partnership Fee on London, so obviously, clues in the name, based in London. Um, and I lead on research, but specifically looking at how you can get young people involved in research and decision making. And Dot? Hi, uh, my name's Dot um, Hodgson, and I work in London for an organisation called the GLA which is the kind of civil service for the mayor of London. Um, my background is in teaching and in um, supporting young people through charities in London. And we're going to share a partnership project that we worked on together to um, bring young people's voices into the policy making of the mayor. Perfect. So next slide, please. Oh, next one. Perfect. So essentially, we're it was called the Young Londoners Research Programme, not the most fun name, but eventually it got a cool snazzy title. But it was a partnership between us, Partnership in London, Rocket Science, who helped with the grants process, Young Harrow Foundation, which helped with the recruitment and on the ground work. And then it was obviously supported by the Mayor of London, thinking about their strategy. Next slide. Uh, that is our contact details we've already talked about. Next slide. Um, the programme had kind of three main aims, essentially. Right. It was about access into youth services. So that's very broad. How can we get more young people accessing good quality youth services on their door? Second one is what are the barriers to attending youth services? And thirdly, specific needs of young people. So what type of activities do they want and what do they want to see? The idea between this programme was to do a youth led approach to it, to get young people to design it, to develop it and then ultimately trial out innovative solutions to the challenges they face in their own local context. Next slide. And I will let Dot talk about the context. Um, hi, everybody. It's so nice to see people from all over the world. Um, exciting to imagine all the amazing youth work you're doing in those different countries. Um, so I wanted to just sort of set a bit of a context for, for why this programme happened um, and where the funding came from for the programme. And then I'm going to hand back over to Matt and he's going to talk a bit about the process and hopefully there's some stuff that's useful to you or interesting in some way for your work. Um, so I work in London and this building here is the uh, the mayor's um, office. Uh, it's called City Hall and um, this building is called the Crystal, I guess, because of that glass <laughs> shape. And it's down um, near City Airport. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the mayor and how young people's voices um, and interests are reflected in the work that the mayor does. 
Next slide, please. So this is kind of a, um, a couple of pictures from a launch event that we had for the Young Londoners Research Programme. And um, I, I love these because it shows young people at the heart of London's government. This is City Hall. It doesn't look very exciting now, but it's a, it's a, it's a room within City Hall. <laughs> and these are young people um, from do, two different groups that took part in this programme, talking about uh, their projects, which they designed, and the research that they were going to do. Um, so these young people are from an organisation called Resources for Autism, and they looked at um, barriers to autistic young people accessing youth services and how we can make youth services more inclusive for neurodiverse young people. And these guys are from an organisation called the Albany in South London, and they were looking at how uh, youth spaces, access to space, to hang out and to build relationships with friends, how that impacted on young people's mental health and well-being. But what are they doing there and how did they get there and how is it all linked to what the Mayor of London does? So I'm going to attempt to explain that. Next slide, please. Um, so actually, I'm going to go back one just for a minute, please. We'll see uh, okay. how quickly okay. you manage to read that. Um, so I know some of you are Londoners, so you're going to know this already. But if you are not from London, do you know who the mayor of London is? I'm mm. wondering, does anybody in the room, you're nodding back, do you know who the mayor of London is at the moment? Yes. Sadiq Khan. Yes. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, about Sadiq Khan and, and what his, um, yeah, next, next one please, and what his priorities are. Um, so this is the mayor of London and uh, in London we have one elected mayor for the whole of London. There are actually a couple of mayors for some of the boroughs as well, but um, but uh, the mayor of London has an oversight of all of the different 33 boroughs that make up London. And obviously it's a city with a, a massive population and pockets of, of, of real, real wealth and also um, a lot of people living in deprivation as well. So it's a, it's a big job, big responsibility, and there's a lot of different competing priorities. Um, and there are 25 assembly members who are elected by Londoners and they're there to challenge the mayor and hold the mayor to account. And the mayor is supported by a kind of civil service called the Greater London Authority. And I'm one of about a thousand people who work in that. So just a, a very small cog in this big machine, which is about getting the mayor's priorities and yeah. their capacity of commitments done. Um, yeah, so the, so the Greater London Authority was created after a referendum of Londoners in 1998, where Londoners chose to have a directly elected mayor to represent their interests. Um, and the mayor, of course, the mayor of London is always sort of asking central government to devolve more power and more financial authority so that we can ensure that um, that uh, local Londoners um, interests are reflected in the policies and the programmes that are delivered. Anyway, you can have a look on london.gov.uk if you're interested. Next slide, please. Um, so the the study come has been the mayor for two terms and mayoral terms are four years and there'll be a mayoral election in May just coming up. But these are some of the priorities that this mayor has set out. So his work is about making the city a city for all Londoners. And he's responsible for transport for London, making it easier for people to get around the city, for improving London's environment. For example, there's a big um, kind of a policy impacting all Londoners, which is being rolled out at the moment, which is the ultra low emission zone, which means that um, you cannot drive a uh, very controversial very policy, controversial. very controversial, splits the population in London. And we'll see what people think when he is up for re-election in May whether that means that he's forced out or not. Um, but that's all about improving the air quality in London. <laughs> and he's also responsible for helping London's businesses, making sure that Londoners have more affordable housing, because if you've stayed in London, lived in London, you know it's an extremely expensive place to live. And in terms of young people, that is a real challenge, because it means that young people who are born and brought up in London can't necessarily stay in London when they want to have families and buy their own home. Um, but the, the one that I care most about, of course, is this bottom one here, which is about giving young people in London more opportunities. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what our work has been on that over the last couple of years. So 
you might not know this aspect, and I didn't before I worked with the GLA, the Greater London Authority, but the mayor is very committed to listening to young people. And so there are a number of different um, kind of structurally inbuilt ways of hearing from young people about their priorities. And I've just listed a couple of them here. But for example, in my team, um, we have a sort of a, a team within a team, which is uh, a group of young people called the Peer Outreach Team. And they are, there's about um, 30 of them that are aged between 15 to 30 years old. And their job is to advise the mayor on policies for young people. And they also advise all the different um, departments across City Hall on housing, on transport, to ensure that young people's voices are reflected in the policies that are being um, developed. There's also a London Youth Assembly, which reflects, it's like a shadow of the London Assembly. Um, and there are a number of specific topic based action groups, like, for example, the Violence Reduction Unit has a very active young people's action group who is shaping um, policy related to, to, to violence reduction. There's also a lovely group which is um, called the Link Up Crew, which is for seven to 15 year olds. And there are programmes like this one, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I just wanted to show you, this is actually the old City Hall, which if you've been to London is right by Tower Bridge and it's this sort of beehive shape. Um, and uh, it has this sort of swirling spiral going up it. And at the centre is the assembly chamber. And here you can see the London Youth Assembly, which has a representative young person from every borough in the city sitting and meeting and talking about issues that relate to young people. And so you can kind of get a picture of how young people are part of the heart of London's government. So at the moment, the mayor is committed to delivering on nine different missions and I won't go into all of them, but just to give you a bit of an idea, a bit of a flavour, they're to do with building stronger communities, helping um, Londoners get good jobs, um, ensuring there's financial security, making sure that London's mental health and well well-being is addressed. But the one that relates to our area of work and is linked to this project is called a New Deal for Young People. And I'll say a little bit more about what that is. So I've been working on that for the last couple of years. Next slide, please. And um, the kind of the big goal of that mission is to ensure that 100,000 disadvantaged young people have access to a mentor and that all young Londoners have access to quality local youth activities. So massive ambition, very scary when I started working on this, particularly that 100,000 target. But I'll tell you that we have made some good progress and I'll show you a little bit later where we've got you on that target. Um, but the good thing about this mission commitment is that the mayor is publicly saying we commit to doing something big and bold for young people. And we believe in the power of youth work and the importance of youth work and that kind of building that trusted relationship over time. We've referred to it as mentoring in this mission, but we know that that's what youth work is all about. And we um, are committed to providing opportunities for the most disadvantaged young Londoners to get that support that they need so that they can take up some of the opportunities that London offers. Um, so around this mission, around getting 100,000 young people to have access to quality mentoring, we've been doing work around the quality of mentoring, the quantity of mentoring, make sure there's enough opportunities out there, and also sustainability, trying to build the investment that the mayor's made into um, networks, into resources, so that we can kind of keep this going once the money runs out. Um, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but just to give a flavour of some of the work we've been doing, there's been a big investment in mentoring. Um, so, so far, the mayor has invested £34 million in mentoring opportunities for young people in the city over the last couple of years. And this year alone, we are allocating £20 million in funding for mentoring opportunities. And we think that that's the most ever um, allocated in any UK city for mentoring. Um, and this gives a bit of a flavour of the kind of spread projects that we're funding. We've had two rounds, so this is just the first one. But and you might be thinking, OK, well, all this mentoring, but who is it actually reaching and how you're making sure that it's reaching young people that need support most? So we have a, a, a target group 
um, a, a list of target groups that we most want to reach based on research that indicates that they are most likely to be disadvantaged and need that support. So, for example, I know it's hard to see on here, but we're supporting um, we're funding projects that support uh, young refugees and asylum seekers, young people from Gypsy Roman traveller communities, young people who are care experienced, young people who are excluded from school, young people who are carers. Those are just an, a few examples of the kind of groups. Um, next slide, please. And this is round two. So this is the most recent work that we've done, funding organisations across the city. And I'm really proud of some of the organisations that are represented there, <clears throat> real specialists, as well as organisations delivering on massive scale too. So we're going from organisations that have got specialisms, for example, in supporting young women who are care experienced, or supporting, we're funding a programme which ensures that um, trans and non-binary young people across the city have access to a mentor who has that lived by and um, that uh, lived experience. So that just gives a bit of a flavour of what is going on at the moment. Um, and we've published this online, so forgive me for giving it a little plug. If you are delivering mentoring in your in your city or in your organisation, and you're interested in kind of building that work, we've developed a tool which is totally free to download, which is called the Mentoring Quality Framework, which looks at different aspects, um, different standards for really good quality mentoring, and it. Um, provides 40 indicators that organisations can use to reflect on their practice and see what they might want to improve. So that's there, free to download, please use it, it's just part of the, the mission. And I think this is the last one for me, so forgive me for taking up quite a bit of time with what the Mayor's doing, but as you can see I was a bit, I told you I was a bit frightened of that target, but this massive investment, the work of I think we're funding over 100 organisations now delivering mentoring across the city and the commitment of the people in those organisations means that so far 50,000 disadvantaged young Londoners have had access to mentoring. So I'm now beginning to believe that we're going to reach that 100,000, which is really exciting. Um, and also the mentoring quality framework. When we first developed that, I was like, oh God, nobody's going to want this. Nobody's going to want to download this. And so I had them set up like on the, on the internet, this little form. So it sent me an email every time someone downloaded it. I was like, and I contacted all my team. I was like, we've got to 30, we've got to 30. And I got very excited. But we've now actually had 550 organisations that are using that framework, which I guess I hope says something about it actually being a useful tool. So the, we've got a long journey to go. But as you can see, we're kind of getting there with delivering on this promise that the mayor has made. Um, and the Young London's Research Programme is part of that commitment because all of this work needs to be underpinned by Youth Voice and by a real insight into the, into the support that young people in London need. And not just the young people who come forward, the ones who are often very active in the London Youth Assembly, who are confident enough to go to their local youth centre by themselves and get involved, but the ones that are maybe at home, feeling isolated in their bedrooms that are not confident to do that. So this programme was about, that Matt's going to tell us more about, was about reaching out to those young Londoners who most need the support, but are least likely to come forward and get it. And who's the best place to go and speak to those young Londoners? Well, it's certainly not me. So we needed to invest in young researchers, pay them, train them, make sure they are properly rec recompensed for their time and give them the time to develop the skills to go and speak to other young Londoners and find out how we need to shape services for them. So that's where this programme comes in. We can go straight to the video. So this was a quick video made by You Me Us TV. They're a fantastic organisation with young people recruited from East London who get trained in doing the video work. And basically they were there for pretty much most of the training sessions and all kind of launches. And they made this video, which summarizes it quite nicely. So that was the video. Um, to, uh, next slide. Next slide. So uh, just going to talk you through the process really quickly, a little bit more in detail uh, past the video. 
first thing to know, it was a participatory grants process. So we invited groups of young people to be the ones writing the applications rather than organisations. Obviously, they would need to be supported by those organisations, but we tried our best to make it as accessible as possible. So they didn't have to write a proper bid. They could do video. We just had a set bunch of questions and the young people were invited to respond how they wanted. So we had one group who actually just did video responses to each of the questions. They basically filmed a bit of a focus group, another group just talking about what they'd like to do or some of the challenges they identified. And then for the grants process itself, we had a group uh, a little bit from the GLA, but also the peer outreach team. So that youth voice structure, we had young people sitting on the grants process. So either the peer outreach team or young people had already been involved in some sort of peer research. Next slide, please. So when we talk about it, we're talking about participatory action research. In London, it's used very interchangeably between peer research, participatory action research, community research, experts by experience, youth led research, loads of different terms. Generally, we mean participatory action research with this. Uh, we found peer research has become a little bit of a bandwagon recently. You know, when we started doing more of this work four or five years ago, it wasn't really seen as much. Organisations weren't doing it as much. You saw more in kind of Imperial University, patient led design, but less in the youth sector. Now we're seeing it everywhere. So we're seeing councils funding it. We're seeing the Mayor of London who's just done this project and it's kind of picking up a little bit of steam. But what we mean by it when we talk about peer research is those three points participatory and by that we mean trying to get young people involved in every aspect of the research from design to implementation to delivery to making change they are in the driving seat wholly owned and controlled by them we're talking and evaluating about stuff like agency and ownership and checking and monitoring that young people have a sense of agency and ownership over the project action this is the really really key one we keep saying this to young people when we work with them we are not doing research for research sake this is not to get a percentage at the end to kind of fuel something else we're really interested in what's the ability to influence change what are the opportunities and how do you take stakeholders along with you so when you do this research it's actually going to lead to something right young people really want to see the action part of it some of them are really interested in research, but generally the ones that you know are, are most passionate about this want something to change. And then last thing is research. So how do you teach research skills and get young people involved in research? Next slide. So we based our work on this involving young Londoners a toolkit for peer research. We're funded by Trust for London to look at it. And this was also supported by the Mayor of London. This is an online resource. Quick plug. Have a look at it. Basically, we did about three and a half years of peer research, supporting about 15 organisations to do their own peer research. Some of it was one month long. The longest one was about eight months. There's a real diversity about projects and we have to kind of respect the capacity and funding of different organisations and be flexible about that. But we based and we put all of three and a half years of learning into that toolkit. So have a look at what our structure is. But basically, we kind of did the same thing again, recruiting them, deciding on a research project, looking at the approach, designing the research methods. How do you support young people safely in terms of in the field work? How do you teach them about analysis and then implementation recommendations? Next slide, please. So. We basically have a model where we teach young people something and then we get them to act on what they've learned, i.e. putting it into practice, making a decision. So, for example, in workshop one, really clear, it's an introduction to research. What are we researching um, and what the project is? But by the end, it's very much what is your research project? What is your research question? What are the things that are coming up? Why did you get funded to do this project? Second one, methodology and stakeholders. We teach them about methodologies. We give a broad approach. Here's surveys, here's interview guys, here's focus groups, here's some creative methods that have been used well in the past. But what do you want to do? What's appropriate for your project? And we saw a real mix. Some decided to just do a survey with 500 responses. Some said, look, we've already done a survey in the, in the borough recently. I just want a really clear qualitative approach. And then we would support them with that. Third one, ethics, safeguarding and field work. I mean, this is a real question that we're still kind of grappling with. What do research ethics look like, especially if you're doing qualitative research with young people? How do you protect them from stuff like re-traumatisation, especially if they're going out to do field work? Um, and also, what does ethics and research ethics look like? So we know what safeguarding looks like, but how does it look like in a research context? And we know what ethics looks like within research, but how are you taking young people along with them? So we're not expecting young people to you know, write panels for ethics committees, but basic stuff like consent forms. How do you design up a consent form that is still valid and still protects you legally, but actually is done by young people as well? So they're understanding ideas about digital consent, GDPR. It's not just something that you go, right, we're the organisation, we deal with this. Just just get people to sign it, right? Don't worry about what it says. You take them along with the journey so they understand every point of the consent form. 
optional workshops we have to if they decide fill uh, focus groups we just do a group on focus groups if they did surveys we just talk about surveys and then we help them design that analysis as well so actually it was really nice to bring all nine groups together about 40 young people they all have different research results we put it all out on a table and we teach them about thematic coding uh general coding of qualitative data and also we support them with quant data so survey data how do you break it down by groups you know for certain groups we do particular spss stuff when the sample number was high but basically really teaching them and then their key findings what are your top 10 key findings and then what are your re recommendations? And very lastly, that key findings in the recommendations process. So that's the basic workshop structure, right? But as uh, the video said, we were really keen on getting stakeholders involved at every process, at every stage. And this is important. These groups were recruited because, not because they're good at research, not because you know they're really well known regionally and have lots of influence and power, but because they have really strong relationships with young people in that local community, right? So when we're training them, we can handle the research side, we can work with them. And it's not just teaching the young people, it's also teaching the staff and the youth workers that support them. So it's a co-produced journey, they're on that journey with them. But then also, how can we at critical stages invite external stakeholders to help shape that research as well? So once they'd gone through uh, most of the research side of it, we had a research launch at City Hall. And this was about the young people presenting up their draft Key fire, uh, their draft research question, their research approaches, and then hearing from other stakeholders, presenting it and having a conversation. So a lot of the groups, for example, came up with mental health, right? Really interesting. Mental health is a really big thing for Londoners, but actually you had lots of the groups in the NHS and commissioning bodies and people who work for healthcare, and they basically went, great, but we know this already about mental health, but we don't know this. How can we make your question a little bit more specific? How can we focus it down on? And how can we provide support or capacity to make it a better piece of work, right? So from the very beginning, August, they're already cited on it. So hopefully they can go on that journey with them. Every single time they finalize the survey, they can send it to the stakeholders being like, thanks for your advice, but here's what we've come up with. Is there anything else, right? And it's about getting that buy-in from all those local, local organizations. So by the very end, you know where the research is gonna land. And also you're priming those young people to have relationship with stakeholders as well. So it's not just the staff communicating the results, it's those young people who, you know, the leader of the council knows by name already and knows, oh, you're that person I spoke to four months ago, you're doing this, fantastic. It's about that relationship. Next slide. So, I mean, really, really quickly, we did some evaluation work. It wasn't fully whole because, you know, thinking about how you evaluate some of this stuff. We talked about young people sort of describing their experience on it, talking about confidence that they can make decisions about their projects. Some of this was done at monitoring points. Some of it was done at beginning and end. We also looked at soft skills in terms of what they learn in terms of speaking and listening and then research skills. But actually what we want to develop up is how do you evaluate participatory action research for young people? We know how to do it for soft skills. We know how to do it for research skills, but how are you monitoring that sense of ownership and agency? I think one of the challenges that we have around this work is a lot of people are saying that they involve young people in research design and decisions, but how do you actually track that? Sometimes it's just one or two pages in the end report saying we got young people involved in this, but how do you prove it, right? So there needs to be a job of how do we evaluate and monitor participation in a research context and check at every stage that young people do feel in control and do feel a sense of ownership. Next slide. So I'm just going to quickly kind of summarise uh, with this point. So we talked about four principles. <laughs> First one is equal participation between peer researchers. So again, they had full control over it. We were really, really keen not to write any of the interview questions. We might help them kind of craft a survey question in terms of what format it is. But essentially all of the questions written by them, all the key decisions written by them, they could come up with the output, whatever the color scheme is. Basically it was really up to them. That can be really challenging, especially given a funding environment. How do you budget or put a budgeted proposal for something that is so, out there in the world. I mean, that can be a real challenge. Um, but the second thing is about mutual respect for uh, experience and expertise. You know, the idea of it is that the young people were the experts of that local space or that local group and respecting that lived experience. I think the key one there is just about paying them, making sure that young people are paid London living wage for all of their time. They are treated as researchers rather than just, we're going to give you a token thing of our gratitude. You are paid hourly for your time on this work. You know, you are the experts of your local area. I live in another part of London, but London's a big place, right? So I don't know anything about your context just because I live in the same city. So respecting that and making them recognise 
what experience they have and what they are experts in and what to bring that to the table, right? I just do the research bit. I'm the data nerd I describe, but actually all the important stuff about the challenges and the things you're researching, you guys are the experts on it, right? We just take a facilitated approach. Third one, I've talked about this, just informed decision making, teaching them and then doing. And then how do you make sure that your teaching has gone in and that they are making informed decisions? That can be quite a tricky one and it depends on how much time you've got with them. And then the last bit is maximum involvement. So getting young people involved in every single part, not just the research, but also the implementation and design. So obviously there's some big learnings for the regionals, but actually when it came to the recommendations, we kind of looked at three main things. One, that blue sky thinking, what do you want in an ideal world? How do you radically shift some of the structures? How do you design stuff that completely changes the system? Second stuff is how can you use stuff on a really hyper-local approach? Um, and then thirdly, regional. But I will talk about key findings next one so i'm not going to go through uh too much of it but i just want to give you a flavor of it so this is avenues youth project they were a group of five young girls who they basically wanted to one understand why there were not as many young girls going to their youth club because they just noticed they were the only ones so they came up with that research question looking at the barriers for young girls they had a whole range of key findings and recommendations all the groups do but i'll just focus on one and how it links to the recommendation so this one they talked about traveling safety safety was a really big concern in the local area i think there was something really specific about the road going to the youth club and as a result very specific for their organization what they're going to do is they're going to look at a service minibus to drop offs it's not reinventing the wheel in some of the cases it is really simply here is a problem that we found in our local youth club in the surrounding streets this is the thing that we want to change about it, right? Some parts it's about giving a mandate, using young people to kind of give a mandate for something that you might want to do anyway. Sometimes it's something they haven't even thought about. Next one. This one, Haringey Youth Advisory Board, really linked to Haringey Council. They were looking at mental health and stress. This is one of the ones that kind of wanted to look at mental health generally and then working with their external stakeholders. They really looked at actually the crunch time during exams. And they found the great, greatest stress was uh, competing priorities during exam period, so work and home life. So, for example, now they're just working with Haringey Council and they're looking specifically how, how they can boost mental health service levels at specific exam times as well. Just helping making sure there's more provision in pace. Crunch times. Soapbox Youth Centre, they were looking at the access um, into digital work. So. How can we get more young people from socially excluded backgrounds to enter into digital technology? They are based literally in the area where there's all the tech companies, um, but they found that less than 5% uh, used software applications as a digital skill and unfamiliarity with digital technologies. But then one of the key recommendations is really good. Two of the peer researchers, they actually just went to a games developing company on the corner and just went, look, we found this. What are you going to do about it? Really pressured them into it. And now us two interactive are going to do a masterclass on game development, right? And they might have done it if I knocked on the door, right? But I don't have any connections to the area. I didn't do any research. It was them basically being empowered by the work they've done to basically pressure the games company to do something for local young people on that local step, right? And certain sectors we know don't engage as readily. There's more corporate responsibility and gaming development and tech companies didn't really do as much. So it was interesting to see them be really pressured to do it. Next slide. Highbury Roundhouse, uh, they were looking at challenges around professional mental health, but very specifically within the space of Highbury and Roundhouse. Uh, again, really something that we know again and again in terms of don't want to their parents or school to be involved. It's about how that information is shared. And then they want to look at cultural differences in gender stereotypes. So very specifically how their youth workers in the space can be trained around cultural differences and sensitivities and recognising the diversity within Islington as well. And how do you design specific programmes to speak to those different communities? Thanks, one. Resource for Autism, really interesting. They looked at uh, supported a mainstream education and special educational needs schools. I think the key one here is 38% of those attending mainstream education did not feel that teachers understood their needs as a young autistic person compared to those in SEND schools. And actually there's a very clear recommendation and a work there that needs to be done nationally about how are we training up teachers in mainstream schools to recognize autistic young people's needs and actually um, support them with their work. Slide. Uh, Chicken Shed Theatre, they looked at some uh, special social, emotional and mental health schools. So young people with uh, particular emotional needs and 
you know, I think there was a real key one because they go to these SMEH schools. They are usually seen as difficult children or children with particular needs or issues. And there was a really clear one about identity that came out about how do you actually celebrate them? They found that those young people, they didn't have much time where they were actually celebrated. They were always treated as a caseload, as a challenge. So actually really easy, simple one, right? They wanted a newsletter in the school to, to highlight the successes of young people there, right? You are not in this school because you are a challenge, even though that might be why you're recommended here. You're in this school because you're here to learn, you're here to thrive, you're here to achieve. And here is a newsletter to celebrate that, right? Creating more of a sense of that identity within the school that isn't just you're here because you can you got kicked out of the other school, right? You're here because you want to do well. Right. Next one. Sounds like chaos. Uh, Really interesting. They did specific space, um, arts and art spaces in particular. Um, well, they've got really good art space in Deptford. I think the most interesting one about this, though, is on the right, they did a event called Poetry Places, uh, People, Places and Poetry. And basically, they got all the key findings from their result. They invited all the stakeholders and then they did a spoken word artistic event where they demonstrated all the key findings through spoken word and then kind of had a bit more of a cultural laid back thing to invite all of the council to. So a really interesting way of translating kind of what can be seen as nitty gritty boring key findings into something quite creative, something quite cultural and something that engages the community. Uh, Hammersmith and Fulham, they were looking at mental health services in particular, really, really clear specific mental health services within the borough online virtual sessions and I think that was very much reflecting the ge geography of the borough I don't think you know that finding would have been the same if it was certain boroughs it was very particular to that one next one London Merton so they had already done a really big quant piece where they talked to 2000 young people about the needs of care experience young people so they just wanted to look at that right here's what everyone said in a big survey but how can we do the on ground work how can we do interviews focus groups qualitative work to actually understand what it means and then they had really specific means uh, recommendations that they crafted with the children and care council across those boroughs look at mandatory sessions for staff and a couple of other things Right, so that was all of the key findings, all really, really quick. I think the key thing to note is they all had really different key findings, really, really specific. There was some kind of overall themes across all nine groups around mental health, but you know, it was a really diverse group. We gave them kind of control over it. So as a result, all of the key findings and recommendations are all over the place as well. But that's kind of the strength of it, right? They all have their own specific things for specific areas, and there wouldn't be as much that we can bring together. Right, Dot. Oh, wait, I've got evaluation. One more. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, evaluation very, very quickly. The last thing from me is we'll be evaluating the impact of it kind of three ways. The first way is developing up a peer research evaluation framework. We are doing that as collaboratively as possible um, across England at the moment. But again, this is very simple. How are we evaluating for peer research? If anyone has any ideas or have done it themselves or are looking at it, please come into contact with us. First thing we're doing is a literature review on it, but it is that stuff of how do you monitor for agency? How do you monitor for ownership? And if someone is saying that a piece is participatory action research with young people, how do you actually prove it? How do you actually show that it's participatory, right? We can show you a video. I can tell you how the lesson goes and you might agree with me. But if I had to summarize it in one or two words about why you should commission this, how do I actually prove that I'm doing what I'm saying I'm doing? Second one, we're doing a peer research advisory board. So actually those 32 researchers, the legacy of it's really interesting. Four of them, those four girls from Avenues, they're all youth workers now. They've actually gone into jobs on youth work, right? And they weren't interested in that before. So there's some clear employment things where they've gone straight into that field. They're interested in research now before. And also we want to keep them on board. So how do they advise and look at peer research projects across London? And then the first thing the peer research advisory board will do is how are we evaluating this? So six months on, which will be about September, October, we will go back to all of the groups and ask them about what has happened, not just for the young people, but for the organisations and actually locally. What impact have they actually made? If, they, if there's no changes, if they haven't implemented anything, then the project will be a failure, right? It's about actually what specific impact and change have they made as a result of the work. Right, Dot? Thank you. Don't worry, we're, we're pretty much finished, but I know I, I can imagine that you're listening and thinking, well, well, what's going to happen to those recommendations and how are you going to make sure that it leads to some real change? So um, the first step, so we only published the research in June, so we only had a, a month to kind of promote it and we're still in that phase, really. But the first step is to help the young people to disseminate their findings. 
So in London, I told you we have 33 boroughs. So the first thing to do is to make sure that the findings go to the leads for youth services in those different boroughs and the MPs, the members of parliament that, that represent those different boroughs. And then there's thinking regionally, so across the whole of London, and that's where my organisation, the GLA, comes in. How can we make sure that policymakers who are looking on that wide scale are listening? So that's part of my job, to make sure that the mayor and the deputy mayor, the London Assembly members, listen to the recommendations and take them into consideration as, for example, the um, mayor begins to build his new manifesto for the elections in May. And then also thinking about the national level, can we interest the Department for Culture, Media and Sport in this? Because that's the, um, that's the department in our government in England that is responsible for youth services. And finally, is anybody else interested? We wanted to share it today. So when we heard about this opportunity, we wanted to say, look, this is how you can do youth research and this is how you can involve it in uh, regional government. Um, so we're still working on the dissemination. Um, but one success we've had is that we've sent the research to the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, and this is their feedback. So they wanted to tell the young people, we've seen your research and we want to congratulate you. We thought it was a rigorous process, that the recommendations are really uh, clear and practical, and that their team and the Minister for Youth Affairs will be considering the findings. And the other thing is they've invited us. Um, so Matt is going to be uh, bringing together a small group of the young researchers to go and speak to their team. So that's a big win for us because we're now taking young people who have led these local projects in their community to go and speak to the team within, um, within uh, the UK's government about what they found and about peer research and about how they can do it too. So we're excited about that. That's happening in August, we hope. Um, and last one is for me, really, is to make sure my colleagues who work on the New Deal for Young People are listening. And um, so I held a sort of review session with the with my colleagues the other day to say, look, here's all the recommendations. What can we do? And this is my draft um, of nine commitments. There were nine projects. So this is my draft of what I think that we can get done through the New Deal for Young People. I won't go through every single one, but to, for example, um, you heard that recommendation around um, autistic young people, and they didn't just say that teachers didn't understand them, they also said that youth workers did not understand their needs and that youth spaces they didn't feel comfortable in. So that was uncomfortable news to us to hear, but it's something we need to address. So we're funding an organisation called Resources for Autism to go out and to train um, youth practitioners in how to make their services more inclusive for neurodiverse young people. So that's just one little example. But also you heard about the avenues, those four young women who became the youth workers and wanted more girls to go to the youth clubs. Well, we have funded at least four specialist young women's projects that are going to be delivering across the city, delivering mentoring. And one of those, led by an organisation called Active Communities Network, is working in 11 boroughs and they're going to establish a network of female youth professionals so that they not only are sort of delivering that support to young women, but are addressing the systemic issue of the fact that the sector is, is dominated by men. So just a couple of examples um, and we are going to wrap up. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothy and Martin, for the, the very good overview and sharing on what your research work in the London area with the mayor's office has been doing. Um, I suspect that it was very interesting to see from the conceptual bit all the way down how it's done, some of the research and, and where it's going to go. Perhaps you have some questions that you might want to share with them or anything that wasn't so clear. Let me just take two, and then we're going to go straight to another re part of the world, the Caribbean region. So queuing you up so that you have, after two questions, we'll go to our other colleague in the Caribbean to hear how, from another context, the, the story comes and how different it is. Let's take those two hands. Say your name and... and Sorry, yeah, uh, I'm just basically... I, I think it's great. I think the, the research is a really good approach. I really applaud you for, you know, getting young people involved at such a grassroots stage. Um, just a question, really. Um, I'm always a bit sort of 
curious, cynical, whatever, around sort of um, when I hear kind of youth mentors rather than youth workers as a term, yeah, um, but there's sort of connotations to both and arguably mentoring and youth work aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, there's elements, I would argue, of youth work um, that you could argue does mentoring. Um, but I think they're different. Uh, I, I mean, I, I lecture in youth and community work, so let's just give you a bit of my background. So I train youth workers. Okay? I've been training youth workers for 15, 16 years. Okay? So, yeah, but I would argue, and I've, but I've also run mentoring programs and train mentors, okay? so, but I would argue they're different. So I suppose, you know, my, my question slash observation is, why say, for example, Sadiq Khan and, and the mayor's office have kind of have gone down the line of, uh, you know, 10,000, 100,000 uh, mentors as opposed to 100,000 youth workers, yeah. for example. You know, yeah. wh why, why that sort of, you know, maybe it's a political, you know, it, it just looks more appealing, maybe it's a title, I don't know, but just a question. I yeah, I think that's a good question. And it's one that my team has grappled with a bit because the, the previous um, kind of manifesto commitment from the mayor's prior term was a big uh, pot of funding, 45 million through a programme called the Young London's Fund, which um, which funded activities all across the city. Amazing. And it didn't, so it wasn't branded in the same way as it has to be this particular type. I mean, what part of it is, is related to research that happened um, on the back of the pandemic and asking young people and asking local authorities, what do young people want? And what kind of support do they want? And them talking about that trusted relationship. But I hear you that there's more to youth work than, than just mentoring. sort of the mentoring angle. I think I think maybe one of the reasons why there's that focus is also about the kind of accessibility, the feeling that for Londoners, they can get involved in helping young Londoners themselves. So it broadens it out. And I know that that's Kind of a bit controversial because um, uh, youth work is a is a profession and a highly skilled profession and you don't want to give the impression that anybody can do youth work well so actually what we're funding so we've had to navigate that quite carefully and in all the kind of specs for what we're funding we've said you know at, at, we, we we acknowledge that mentoring is a core cool part of youth work that you, the youth work profession is extremely important and that ultimately at the heart what we're talking about is building a trusted relationship over time mm -hmm. and that's given us the flexibility to fund programs some programs are using volunteer mentors but I'll be honest with you it's the minority because the because I told you about the targeting because it's targeted at disadvantaged groups of young people actually that work is quite skilled work that's going on mm -hmm. so the vast majority of the cases there is mentoring at the core but the mentoring is being delivered by trained youth mm -hmm. professionals um so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying I hear what you're saying I think mm -hmm. that it is partly to do with uh, a sort of inclusive approach that means that Londoners can come forward and become mentors. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the reality is that um, that the majority of the funding is going to train youth professionals mm -hmm. who are delivering that one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, but I hear what you're saying. Maybe it's a recommendation to take back to say, let's make it youth I'd, workers. I'd 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 so. tell you, I would love that to be. <laughs> so if you could, you could back feedback and say from the conference, there was a, you know, no, a Because on the back of the last session, for example, the, the, the gentleman from um, Nigeria was talking about approach they've got, which is training youth leaders who yes. then feed into becoming youth workers okay so there's that very sort of tiered approach so if you look at say your model okay you're, you're bringing in youth leaders to do let's let's catch it in that phrasing to do mentoring that then feed into youth work as a profession so you've got that more I'm linking to sessions. Sustainable, yes. Right. There's, there's like a sustainable uh, professional well, development as well. We'll take a second question from this side, and if or if the, and then we go straight to our colleague from the Caribbean. Who's had what's up first? Yes, please go ahead. Name and a little bit more. Just so. yeah, I'm Fiona from Lancashire Youth Services. We we have a I have a particular interest in in peer research. We've had, and I, I would agree with Kesa. I was interested that youth work 
competencies are embedded in that. It, it must be from the approaches that you're um, you're using. It'd be quite nice to see youth work labelled as such, and you can up there in front. And um, I really liked what you you've got uh, the involvement of young people right from the start. You would you would phrase it or frame it in youth peer led projects where we would be asking young people right from the very start to identify the issues, look at the inquiry. But I don't I don't have the expertise of the research um, expertise that you're talking about. So the, the data collection or the very qualitative um, inquiries. So we, we've done PSE review, which is personal, social and education reviews within schools. We've been able to get young people trained up as the facilitators, as peer leaders. They would go into primary schools and secondary schools and they would do that research, find out what's the experience and recommendations from young people. And we've managed to feed that back. So I suppose what I'm saying is that there are models of peer led inquiries, but I'm really interested in the toolkit and I'm certainly going to take some time to look at it. But I do think there is. Um, am I watering about the amount of money that you have? I congratulate the mayor for investing that amount of money. It's true. And it's supposed to be to increase the traffic and access into youth services. But the whole of Scotland's budget for youth work is a fraction of what that is. And I would say that our PSE review, that whole process that we did over a year, we, did, we got no money for, no. for it. Wow. We, we basically put some of our core staff into it so mm -hmm. if you could tell us how to knit the money north <laughs> I think, I think it's a good question. We'll pick up on that response when we compare with what's happening in the Caribbean. Okay. So I'm going to ask our colleague now who is on line um, to come in. Now we in the Caribbean, I guess it's a, a Caribbean island is probably the size of London. <laughs> so, so maybe some of some of this discussion could apply there. But allow me now to welcome um, Taylor from Crick, more about <laughs> Crick and your work and over to you. Go ahead. Please. OK, great. If it's OK, I would love to share my own presentation because I have a few animations in here. Um, so I'll sure. share. Sure. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Say a little bit about yourself while you're doing that. Um, so guys, hello, my name is Sahila Maloney. Mm. I am representing today my entire region of the Caribbean. Um, and I'm just so happy to be here. I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago, um, but my team or the team that I represent here come from a, uh, are a group of amazing young people um, coming from a multitude of different islands and territories and we're just really excited to show you all what we have here so i don't know if you're seeing yes. my screen or my presenter mode yes yeah present are you mode. seeing presenter mode yes yeah okay so just a little bit about the work that we've been doing um it's just been a journey in terms of doing work under the Caribbean Regional Youth Council. And what we decided to do is very similar to what the, I don't know how to stop. Let's go back to three dots. Stay to the presenter mode, the three dots up top. Go back to presenter mode. Go back to where you were, I'll show you. I hate it. Good. That's it. That's it, so then, all right, so those three dots at the bottom there, yep. Yeah, mm. yeah, that one. Yep, yep. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> we stay in the presenter mode. It's fine. We can. You're almost there. Go. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, let me share my other screen. I know exactly what I did wrong. <laughs> I know exactly what I did wrong. Share. Window. Share. Great. Great. Are you all seeing my presentation now? 
No. 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 Yep, go ahead. Perfect. Awesome. Fantastic. So, guys, all protocols observed. Good afternoon to you and good morning to me. It is a whopping 10 a.m. in the morning. We got up early on this side to give you exactly um, what you came for in terms of a youth perspective on youth participatory action research with inculcations of approaches such as youth of, as the researcher and different aspects of it. My name again is Sahila Maloney and today I will be presenting on harnessing youth power through youth participatory action research on behalf of the Caribbean Regional Youth Council. Today's presentation really re-emphasizes a desire of young people to understand and explore their own lives on their own terms. We as young people do not see ourselves as disempowered or helpless to global powers and current governing systems, but rather as seen in recent movements online and offline, we are also agents of the change that we want to see. As active members of the citizenry, we are working towards strengthening our ability to do our part in the conceptualization and operationalization of all global and regional development policies and related outcomes. We submit that there can actually be no plan or progress towards a sustainable future without us included. As such, today we will explore the use of the YPA methodology as a vehicle for further empowerment for youth by youth. Today's presentation is dedicated in whole to the late Dr. Henry Charles, who is a renowned international youth development specialist and strategic advisor. Dr. Charles is a visionary, a great mind, and most of all, a devoted believer and a keen investor in youth power. May he rest in eternal peace. So just let's get started. Guys, this is the team I was telling you about. Of course, that's my face. That's what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> this is also Shima Wedderburn, who is my uh, lead in terms of my committee. And he was also one of my top contributors. Atiba Morris looking swanky. And he was in charge of all things visual. And Chelsea Dixon, who really helped me on the back end in terms of data cleaning and getting, making sure that information was ready for SPSS. So guys, this was the core team. Of course, there were many other persons, many other young persons involved because this is participatory action research. And we were constantly engaging with a number of teams and a number of stakeholders throughout the entire process. And we just want to tell them, thank you. Without you, we couldn't be here today. From this presentation, we hope that you will take away that. WIPA is a useful tool for youth skill development, collaboration, knowledge sharing, and empowerment. Youth unemployment is dynamic, and young people can reflect on their own educational and vocational shortcomings that prevent employment. Youth advocates and development practitioners can symbiotically increase their level of engagement by employing the existing strengths of young people while adding insight and expertise for capacity building. And the Caribbean Regional Youth Council provides fertile ground for regional youth research efforts and youth capacity building activities. Just a slight plug there. <laughs> So today's big question is what are the factors that contribute to the successful and sustainable implementation of WIPA initiatives and how do they impact the empowerment of young participants?
but we can't discuss that without setting the context. What exactly is creating this environment for disempowerment, whether in the space of research or skill building or capacity building? What is drawing down on our youth population, especially within the context of the Caribbean? We had increased unemployment and a lack of learning opportunities, and this unemployment rate rate went as high as 21% or 25% for women, especially during COVID-19 pandemic. So we had a lot of young persons out of work and currently we're dealing with abnormally high school dropout rates in the region. So we're also seeing that lack of learning contact time, that lack, that lack of achievement. Our, our youth are much more disengaged than they have ever been. Structural inequalities that inhabit access to capacity building programs, for instance, I didn't tell you all anything about my background, but I have a master's in development statistics that would have allowed me to engage. I'm pursuing a master's in development statistics that would have allowed me to engage in this research. What we're talking about here is youth who may not have access to that level of education or may never engage in that level of technical skill development and what is preventing their entrance into these spaces. There is a lack of youth interest in policy development. So we're really digging down and we're like, how are we going to get young people to realize exactly what they need to do in terms of policy development and why they should be interested in policy development? and a lack of political will to engage with youth-led interventions. So we find that there's a lot of tokenism happening in the youth space where we're called to give injunctions or make contributions. However, where are those contributions going? How are they being cemented in future discussions? How is it ju not just a, oh, another tick of, yeah, we spoke to the youth, yes, we did that. What is the consequence of these engagements? And we found that our approach through the quick youth life skills self life skills self efficacy report 2022 was a great solution to these things <laughs> what we did exactly is that it was not just about the report so you see our little flyer here in terms of what exactly that we wanted to do um this is our this is what it looked like again uh we could th thank the quick team for their support in that and of course there's a picture of the core team and the youth life skills self-efficacy report had a dual approach to it so the first half really focused on measuring the young people around us like crick is in charge of or is responsible for representing millions of young people across the region. And what we wanted to be able to do is determine where are we at our life, at our level of life skills development? What is preventing us from getting into employment? And then on the other hand, we wanted to ensure the way that we approached these youth was very inclusive, that it was empowering in itself, that we weren't reconstructing structures that uh, marginalize us. So we weren't creating a powerful and a powerless situation where we held all the power and we were again interacting with these youth in a disempowering manner. We're just literally taking their experiences, manipulating it and slapping it on a screen for somebody else to digest. It was an empowering space through and through and that is the sort of uh, objectives that we had under the the report the survey and any outcome that was supposed to come out from it so in terms of what we actually wanted to get done here some of the key terms that guided from the inception of our research was the idea of ownership of autonomy capacity building resources and support partnership on different levels, so not just on an indiv not just on an organizational level where it was um, Crick talking to national youth councils, but also on an individual level between youth to youth, and on a higher level in terms of maybe Crick to international organizations, which we will see came to fruition. We were also 
having discussions in terms of influence. How did we want our, in our research to influence our population? How did we want it to influence us as researchers? And how did we want it to influence youth research in the policy landscape? And of course, discussions around power, national decision making, capabilities, and re-education, meaning unlearning certain things that would have contributed to who we are or, or, or what or how we define certain things within the research and the non-research frameworks that continues to beget systems of disempowerment for young people. In terms of the theories that we would have used, at the heart of it is an issue of paternalism, which speaks to the infringement on the personal freedom and autonomy of a person with a beneficent or protective intent. Meaning that when persons often approach um, young persons, it is with almost a paternal instinct. Like I have to help you. You don't, you don't necessarily have the capacity to help, help yourself. So I'm going to step in and I'm going to basically give you everything that you need to succeed because I don't necessarily believe that you have a capacity to get it done yourself or I believe that if you do do it you would cause greater harm than good and addressing that at its root and deciding to engage in discussions in terms of where does youth power lie can youth do it for themselves how can they do it for themselves what would that look like and, and beginning to talk about youth rights and, and, and not as second class citizens. We don't need representation when we go to the voting booth. We don't need a representation to go into work. And therefore, we should not have uh, over representation when it comes to our part to play in the in any sort of activity that the that relates to the citizenry. Then we decided, OK. Yes, we have rights, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have every capacity to get everything done. And this is where positive youth development approach comes in. And this involves engaging with youth as resources and equal partners in development, alongside equipping them with a series of protective factors which can lead to positive outcomes for both the youth and youth workers. So we're able to take that protective factor of paternalism or, or we're able within that framework to acknowledge that there are capacities that can be built up upon in terms of young persons. Now, this still wasn't good enough for us because we say, all right, we have some rights and we have some capacity, but we're, it's still a disempowering position because we're still waiting on an outside force to give us something or to work with us um, in order for us to see any sort of empowerment. So it brought up questions amongst the researchers and everybody else. So we don't, we, we don't impact anybody for ourselves. Are we not also playing a role? Are we not also impacting persons around us or ideas around us or discussions around us simply by being this being in this space? And that's why the bull's eye, um, as conceptualized by restless development, comes in. So this is an idea of what the bull's eye looks like. And the bullseye basically says that the development practitioner, as well as the young person, they have different roles in uh, research and policy development and practice. And by sharing these roles, we have a sort of co-ownership happening within that space. And that is the kind of mindset that we wanted to move forward with. We did not want to completely cast out um, the views of older persons, but we wanted to incorporate it without it overthrowing the views of young persons. And we also wanted to strengthen the capacity of the young persons within the program so that one day they themselves will be development practitioners. So just to give an example or just to show you exactly what we did in the research. This is a brief overview of our research methodology. So we had over 405 youth aged 15 to 29 coming from English speaking CARICOM territories. Um, in terms of sample selection, it was a proportional representation. Um, 
for, because amongst the task force, who were the key group of young persons involved in the discussion, we decided we wanted a holistic view of young persons in the region. We wanted one voice. Um, and that is how we wanted to define um, Caribbean youth, not necessarily uh, by equal samples, but how they would look as a whole. Um, in terms of the framework, we would have used the UNICEF life skills survey um, based on recovering learning, and we would have filled in the questions using a myriad of adult literacy surveys. For data collection and analysis, we'd, we used web, web surveys, uh, questionnaires hosted on JotForm, shared on social media, and analyzed with SPSS and Excel. And in terms of that approach, as we said, uh, it's both informed by youth participatory action research and youth as, youth as a researcher because there was a constant system of reflection, a constant system of ensuring that at every level we had a measure of young persons participating and not just experts in the field, um, but young persons from all levels in terms of how we defined key terms, what were the objectives, how is this particular step linking back to the objectives. We ran our pilot and then we asked questions and then we did it again and then we asked questions and remained in constant contact with our target demographic. So what came out of it? From this study, we were able to disaggregate the data under four key areas, foundational skills, digital skills, job specific skills, and entrepreneurial skills. Um, this was actually very shocking to us when we had the findings. And I think this is also why it is so important for young people to lead research, because in our minds, we were the best at everything. <laughs> and we were ready to go into these fields and we were just being marginalized and we were just, it, I think for us, the I, what we came in with is not what we left with. And that was really important for us to do as young people. And when we presented it, it was very important for the young people that we were serving to see our face telling them exactly what they needed to work on. So you found that they did really well in foundational skills, they did it really poor in digital skills, um, and averagely performing in job specific skills and entrepreneurial skills. So as you see, foundational skills ranked the highest um, than all other categories. And uh, this is no surprise to us as the Caribbean uh, boasts uh, over 90% literacy rates. But when we get into those nitty gritties that are really integral to getting into the workspace and even conducting research and working in teams and really being ready to make that next step, we found that we didn't perform as well. And that really called for a lot of introspection and reflection. And we were really happy that we remain flexible in the process so that we're able to go back to our research questions and say, wow, did we do something wrong here? How could we measure this differently? Did we measure the correct things? But it also raised a myriad of other questions that we can't necessarily capture in today's presentation. But even in that reflection, it was empowering for us to know that we did it we know what we felt we know what we found and we know exactly the areas that we need to ask for help so remember that digit that developer um young person uh dichotomous relationship we were talking about by us knowing exactly what we need to ask for we feel empowered because then in response to that we can say this is exactly where we need the funding to go this is exactly and we don't need anybody else um coming to tell us okay well this is what you need and so we find that our theoretical framework was operationalized even though our research questions <laughs> may have been um a little off coming down to the end based on the key findings. So this is just a review in terms of the capacities. So through the process, we were able to identify and measure youth life skills while challenging key definitions of related terms. Like for instance, a big question that came up is, you asked me about literacy, but what does literacy even mean in today's climate? Like how what do you mean by what 
even though we would have asked them it in a different way and we may not have necessarily used the word literacy, they found that we weren't able to ask them what they wanted because literacy is a measure of communication, a, a, a method of reading and writing and interacting with the world and the words around us. And they're like, how are you measuring literacy? Are you measuring my LOLs as literacy, my, my LMBOs as literacy? Because I can communicate and those are methods of communicate communication, but based on current measures of literacy, I'm going to score low on this, but I don't think I'm a bad communicator. So even in terms of how we measured um, certain, uh, certain terms or certain variables, we were challenged because from the top to the bottom, it's like, what do you mean by that? Or this has to change. And as researchers, you know, we want to use the uh, adhere to definition that makes that makes things very easy and very measurable. But in something like that, especially as a young person, they're calling for you to be a little bit different in your approach. So whereas we may not have been able to get to this in this research, it is something that we do intend to incorporate in future youth action research. And of course, there was the combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches through the survey and through that um, reflective process, which allowed researchers to gather both subjective experiences of youth and objective data based on their current skill levels because they're answering the question they're answering the questionnaire but they're also giving us feedback um, because persons who would have been on a task force and um, those of us who would have been very um, integral to the entire process also would have participated in the pilot as well as young persons themselves. Um, of course, that raises a number of ethical issues, but we thought it was an important uh, an important uh, process of participating. And lastly, of course, engaging young persons in research design, data collection and analysis can enhance the relevance and validity of the research outcomes because we're not just asking about youth, we're not just theorizing about youth. Um, it's factual, actual <laughs> um, coming from us to us. In terms of some of the challenges that we would have faced, of course, there is that ad hoc approach to research um, that came up because when we were trying to meet, remain very flexible and we also had to admit in terms of our level of expertise in the subject area of research and the methodology was probably um, limited as compared to practitioners who would have been in it for years as the previous presentation would have pointed out. Um, uh, and our reason was the approaches to various stakeholder inputs and remaining flexible were the key contributors to that. Um, another challenge was the various cultural interpretations of topics or relevance. Um, it, it, was, it even came down to something as simple as post-secondary or university, because some countries or some territories in the Caribbean have uh, um, form six or upper six, whereas in other other countries, they have a mandatory uh, further in education process program. So we, when we got 100% of persons coming from an island um, going to university, we were stumped. We were like, <laughs> you're <are> so brilliant. <laughs> Um, only to find out that we did not take their context um, into consideration and how they would have interpreted the question. Because if it's mandatory, of course, everybody would have attended uh, a a measure, some form of college or university, as opposed to countries like Trinidad or Jamaica, where there's a distinct cutoff point and university has a distinct begin and end that is not necessarily man uh, mandatory. So. Even in that case, you find that they might have 100%, but it's actually a false representation of what is actually happening as other islands, such as Trinidad and Barbados, may have had an actual, um, actually higher rates of university participation. And another challenge is a lack of inclusive representation amongst researchers and respondents, which resulted in a bias. So we had a bias towards university educated persons amongst us, the researchers and our circles and amongst the respondents, because the persons who were most mostly involved in uh, youth work and activism at the level of distribution uh, were most likely to be university um, students. So we found that even though we tried to address gender and we tried to address the age distribution and we tried to address and address and address, we still ended up with biases uh, that we hope to address moving forward. In terms of the insights, engaging in the research process 
with peers builds confidence of the core researchers. So many of them, you hear them say, oh, I didn't know I could do this. Um, I didn't know this was possible. I didn't know this and I didn't know that. And we found that even for myself, who may have had some experience in the field, to hear that it indicated some measure of knowledge transference. And by continually interacting with the process, I hope that the persons who would have um, been learning from me through this process will be able to teach one day. It also influenced a greater sense of accountability and personal investment in skill development for both researchers and participants. Because remember, as I told you, that reflective process, it really made us look inward in terms of we were responsible for the design and therefore we were responsible for the outcome and therefore we felt responsible for ensuring that in the action in action research uh, was able to deal with some of those shortcomings that we that were highlighted and of course when it was discussed within the closed space of the Caribbean uh, regional the Caribbean leadership symposium we found youth leadership symposium we found that it was, people were much more open to the findings. They were much more open to hear because a lot of them would have participated in it. They were much more open to hear in terms of what areas they probably needed to go and do a little bit more research on. So they in themselves uh, became very active in their own youth, in their own development, their own personal development uh, towards increasing the chances for employment. And of course, the research would have increased the profile and visibility of CRIC based on perceptions of a valuable or measurable contributions to development discussions, such as us here today. We're very happy and proud to be able to make this presentation. Um, during the process, we would have been collecting words to give into a word cloud. Um, on the right <laughs> is our question. Uh, our questions or our thoughts coming from our participants, persons who would not have been able to been integral to the actual research process. And you see the big word is questions. And they had a many, many um, different ideas around it. Um, and the second bubble was really from persons who were integral to the research process themselves who were making um, active contributions constantly. And you can see the disparities uh, just in terms of our experiences and what has happened throughout. But Tanya, we're almost out yeah. of time. So you wanted us to make towards the end, any final thoughts? Sure, no problem. So if I could just say, if I could just uh, highlight this in terms of the white power, power strategies, we want to encourage persons to in to seek youth or look meet youth where they are in terms of digital platform engagement, focus on individual asks, so asking specific groups or specific individual youths um, for participation as opposed to a broad call for action. We found that that did not necessarily work as a method for getting youth to want to engage or to see themselves as stakeholders in the process um, to advertise the outcome uh, which suggests moving beyond just youth engagement but showing them exactly where their engagement is going to result and to continue co-working with youth-led organizations for knowledge sharing and the sharing of leadership in these sorts of things and of course uh, with that developer um, youth young person development uh, practitioner and young person rule uh, a great strength was the consultations with pools of expert experienced persons and we want to continue to encourage that as well i would have loved to show you all my outcomes but we'll let's get to the one. recommendations yes so um, in terms of our recommendations, we want to suggest investing in the development of research clusters amongst national youth councils, regional and international youth agencies that are involved in policy and development, employing YPA and YAR methodologies in policy and program development to amplify the importance of the youth voice and to provide funding for general access, research participation, uh, participation, incentivization, training and educational programs for neat young persons to address that bias in researchers and participants and strengthen partnerships and collaboration efforts, efforts with young youth led organizations for mutual knowledge sharing, decision making and development program monitoring and evaluation. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. <laughs>